Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSURGE, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are going to have a look at a paper recently published in the uh, BJS entitled Laparoscopic versus Open Colorectal Surgery in the Acute Setting, uh, the uh, LASES Multicenter Randomized Feasibility Trial. Um, this is followed by a teaching session by Professor Sababala Subramanian on bias in observational studies. Uh, we will particularly be talking about stage migration uh, and immortal time bias. Uh, this will be the first of uh, a few sessions of uh, bias in observational studies. Well, hello everybody. So I'm Olivia Spence, I'm a CT2 in Sheffield and today I'll be presenting with Gio. The paper that we've chosen to discuss is a recent collaborative paper from the British Journal of Surgery titled Laparoscopic versus Open Colorectal Surgery in the Acute Setting, so the LACES trial, and it's a multi-centre randomised feasibility trial. Uh, this is a UK study with the central team based in Newcastle. Um, however, as I've just mentioned, a number of the sites were actually from Yorkshire. So, Gio, do you think this is a relevant paper on an important topic? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, for multiple reasons. Uh, we know we do a lot of emergency operating uh, pretty much in every hospital uh, throughout the UK. Uh, we do about 30,000 emergency GI operation uh, and a third of them uh, are related to some form of colorectal pathology. Um, we know that the vast majority are done uh, with an open approach and that they are associated with a very high morbidity and mortality. We are talking about a 20% mortality and uh, 50% plus mobility um, in, uh, uh, according to NILA. Um, we don't know if uh, adopting uh, a laparoscopic approach routinely would uh, potentially have an impact on this, uh, or uh, if uh, it might not. Um, there are obviously some recognized difficulties in conducting uh, randomized clinical trials uh, in surgery and even more in emergency surgery. So uh, given all the reasons I've sort of highlighted now, yeah, uh, this is definitely a very relevant paper for a lot of reasons. So, uh, ball back to you, Olivia. Great. So, as Professor Sabo has mentioned in his previous tutorial, it is possible to conduct randomised control trials in surgery. And this is what the authors of this study hoped to prove. Given the recognised difficulties, Harj et al. have designed a feasibility trial investigating emergency laparoscopic colorectal surgery. The LACES feasibility trial aimed to assess the safety and the acceptability of performing a phase three randomised control trial comparing LAP with open surgery for emergency colorectal pathology. It is worth noting at this point that in this study there was no statistical hypotheses proposed or powered. So Gio, if you were to put this study into a PICO format, how would you do it? Well, uh, first of all, the population is uh, every patient aged 18 years or uh, older uh, suffering from an acute colorectal pathology requiring uh, an urgent operation. Uh, and in this case, they included only patients categorized as NCPOD 2A or B. Uh, all these patients need to be suitable for a laparoscopic or open approach, and obviously they need to be able to consent. Uh, the intervention in this case uh, would be the laparoscopic uh, colorectal operation, uh, in this case uh, resection. Uh, the control uh, or comparison group would be uh, the standard, so open operation. And the primary outcome of this particular study uh, would be the overall recruitment rate. Uh, as we mentioned, this is a feasibility uh, trial. They also do collect data on a bunch of other secondary um, outcomes, such as the feasibility and acceptability of the trial based on a few questionnaires, uh, the overall uh, process, and obviously the safety uh, of the laparoscopic approach um, too. So, uh, ball back to you, Olivia. Looking at the study design, LACES was designed as a prospective, multi-centre, single-blind, 
parallel group pragmatic feasibility RT RCT with an integrated qualitative element. 64 patients were recruited from two teaching hospitals and three district general hospitals across the UK, all which had dedicated emergency general surgery services with the capabilities to perform laparoscopic surgery both in and out of hours. So Gio, why only 64 patients? That's a very interesting question. Um, so um, overall, uh, this fits with the uh, relatively recently published guidelines on uh, feasibility trials. I, I will be posting a paper in the chat later on. Uh, the magic number to remember here is 30. So uh, when uh, you are trying to assess if uh, doing a, an RCT is feasible, um, generally speaking, the consensus is that 30 patients per uh, arm of your study should be recruited. In this case, they uh, bump it up by 10% uh, to make sure that the dropout rate is uh, actually taken into account. And they are quite successful as they recruit 64 uh, patients in total. Um, so back to you, Olivia. That's great. Thanks, Gio. Um, so randomization was performed centrally on a one-to-one -one basis using the minimization technique. As you can imagine, this is a very complex process to undertake and is done by specialists. Randomization by minimization is problematic though, as it's not truly random, but it does have the advantage of ensuring all the known confounders are fairly equally distributed between the two arms of the trial. Okay, so moving on to the methods. To measure the primary outcome of recruitment, total numbers of screened eligible and randomized patients um, and recruitment rate was analyzed. To measure the secondary outcomes of feasibility and acceptability of trial processes, they conducted qualitative research using multiple validated patient questionnaires on health-related quality of life, pain and blinding. And they also conducted some in-depth, semi-structured patient and clinician interviews. Gio, please can you tell us a bit more about the quality of life questionnaires? Yeah, so the authors here uh, use two questionnaires that we uh, actually have encountered before in our cram sessions. Uh, they use the SF12, uh, which is an American quality of life questionnaire, and the EQ5D5L, a European quality of life um, questionnaire. Uh, they also uh, adopt a gastrointestinal quality of life index questionnaire as uh, it, it's more specific to obviously the background that they are looking at. Uh, these uh, questionnaires are delivered uh, at baseline, so before the operation, uh, three days post-op, seven days and 30 days post-op, three months, six months and 12 months post-op. And as you would expect, they do have some dropout rate, uh, particularly at 12 months, but uh, we'll talk about it later on. So ball back to you, Olivia. Okay, thanks. And um, so the other secondary outcome they were looking at was safety of laparoscopic emergency colorectal surgery. Um, and they assessed this by looking at the intra and post operative complication and mortality rates. They also looked at conversion to open rates and also collected uh, patient safety indicators, otherwise known as PSIs, which are a measure of adverse events that patients experience as a result of exposure to healthcare systems. So the results showed that during the study period, there were 564 patients who were recorded on the NELA database as undergoing emergency colorectal resection across the five sites included. 119 patients were screened, of which 94 were considered, considered eligible for the study. 30 patients were excluded, and this was because either they declined or they were not approached by the team. This left 64 patients who were randomised, 33 into the lap group and 31 into the open surgery group. Gio, please can you give us more details about the characteristics of the patients included in the trial? Yeah, sure. So, uh, well, as you can see here, uh, the authors report uh, a detailed breakdown of the patient's characteristic for the two groups. Uh, 33 patients were in the laparoscopic group and 31 uh, in the open group. Uh, the real uh, sort of juicy part of this table is related to the preoperative diagnosis and the intended surgical procedure. Uh, that would give you an idea of uh, the uh, external validity of this study. Well, 
Uh, as you would expect, the real uh, kings and queens here are corrected cancer and uh, diverticular disease uh, in terms of uh, preoperative diagnosis. And equally, as you would expect, uh, the vast majority of the operation undertaken were either a rightomy, colectomy or a Hartmann's procedure, uh, which again is in line with what uh, we actually see um, on our acute surgical takes. So um, another very important point here is that uh, pretty much all characteristics, including uh, age, BMI and ASA, are fairly equally distributed throughout the group. So uh, randomization and minimization actually uh, did seem to have worked. Uh, back to you, Olivia. OK, so moving on to results, the primary outcome found that the overall mean steady state recruitment rate was 1.2 patients per month per site. As you can clearly see from this graph, recruitment rate per site did vary per month, and but overall they achieved a recruitment rate above what they had expected. Moving on to secondary outcomes, when looking at feasibility and acceptability, um, as we've already said, they used qualitative um, semi-structured interviews of 16 trial patients and 14 clinicians. And the outcome of these interviews indicated that the trial processes were acceptable. However, um, this is a small number of subjective opinions and the study doesn't detail how the patients or clinicians were selected to actually take part in these interviews. The issues that were raised from the interviews included that the, the patients and clinicians felt there were a high number of questionnaires um, and that the relevance of some of the questionnaires was questionable um, and that both patients and clinicians felt that blinding patients was both impractical and unnecessary. Overall, the study found that emergency laparoscopic colorectal surgery is safe, and upon direct comparison with the open group, there were actually fewer complications and lower mortality rates in the laparoscopic group. 30-day postoperative complications occurred in 27% of the laparoscopic group versus 42% of those in the open group, and 30-day mortality was zero in the laparoscopic group and 3% in the open group. However, it's really important to note that the study only gives descriptive statistics. Um, there is no comparative statistical analysis between the two groups, and we are dealing with small numbers here. Also, 13 of the laparoscopic cases were converted to open, um, but they've used intended intention to treat analysis, so they've remained in the laparoscopic group. Um, this is about a 40% conversion rate, uh, which is in line with NELA data. So, Gio, can you tell us about the limitations of this study? Yeah, so so uh, the authors uh, do highlight uh, well what looks like the main limitation really of, of this study, which is really a, a consequence of its uh, design. Uh, this study is not designed to evaluate clinical outcomes. So the clinical outcomes that come out of it are definitely helpful, but uh, again, they should be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, and this is highlighted throughout the paper uh, very well. Uh, there are a few other limitations that we would like to highlight. Uh, well, uh, the small sample size, uh, this is, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, related to the design of the study, but it does affect the reliability of the clinical outcomes that uh, Olivia highlighted very well in our previous slide. Uh, there has been a fairly significant failure uh, of the single blinding protocol. Uh, a, a good percentage of patients uh, were unblinded, either by the anesthetic team telling them uh, what the operation they were going to have was, uh, or because they were peaking when their dressing uh, was actually being uh, done. Um, I personally am uh, not a guru in uh, qualitative um, studies and, and data analysis, but uh, there are a few sort of bits and bobs here that I think are uh, missing. Uh, so the authors highlight very well the protocol that they used to design the semi-structured interviews and that they had two people doing the interviews um, as well. Uh, however, it is not clear how they picked the patients and the researchers that were included in the interviews. And also, they don't seem to have reached saturation of uh, the themes that were coming out of those interviews, or at least they don't clearly state it in the paper. They also don't provide a specific list of the themes that were emerging from the interviews. Um, and finally, uh, they do have a, a very significant dropout rate, uh, particularly for um, quality of life uh, data uh, at 12 months, which is kind of expected. Uh, I don't think they could have done too much to, to avoid that. Uh, so, ball back to you, Olivia. Okay, thanks, Gio. 
So the authors have concluded from the study that laparoscopic emergency colorectal surgery has an acceptable safety profile and it is feasible to deliver a randomised control trial of laparoscopic versus open emergency colorectal resection within the NHS. So here, as you can see, we've created a summary table with the pros and cons of the study that we've discussed throughout the presentation. Thank you very much for listening. In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about what bias is in the context of observational studies. And we're going to talk about two kinds of bias, stage migration and immortal time bias. And uh, this will be particularly of interest to people um, in the cancer field, because these two phenomena relate a lot to cancer research. And I'm going to choose examples from upper GI and colorectal surgery. So if there are any GI trainees, hopefully uh, this will capture their imagination. Right. So let's just talk about what observation studies are. So there's a separate tutorial on uh, observational studies and study designs, um, and that's on YouTube. So you might want to have a quick look at that. Now I'm going to provide a very brief uh, running uh, summary of what observational studies are. So essentially, these are studies that do not necessarily aim to evaluate an intervention and do not intervene in the natural history of the disease. So these are just observational processes. So um, just to look at some examples, what kind of questions are potentially answerable with an observational design? Some examples in the field of thyroid surgery are and some research questions as examples are, what is the prognosis of low risk thyroid cancer? So that's going to be an observational study. Uh, you, you, you build a bit, big database of thyroid cancer patients, uh, identify the ones that, uh, uh, ones that are classified as low risk based on whatever criteria, pick out some prognostic factors you want to study and just run over time to see whether you can use those prognostic factors to relate to uh, clinical outcomes. Another question could be, what are the outcomes of patients undergoing hemi versus total thyroidectomy? Now you could say, is this really observational? It depends on the context and the setting. If you're going to run a randomized controlled trial and randomly allocate some patients to a hemi and some patients to a total, then that's not an observational study. However, if you're going to compare two cohorts of patients, maybe from different hospitals, one of whom usually has a hemi thyroidectomy as per their standard practice, and another group undergoes total thyroidectomy because that's a practice in that other center, then you can uh, compare the outcomes in these two groups and you can still call that an observational study because you haven't intervened in what is naturally going to happen to those patients. You're simply collecting data on patients and that are um, undergoing different treatments. So if you want to understand patients' attitudes and perceptions of radioiodine treatment, for example, that would be an observational study because you're not changing practice with regards to radioiodine, you're simply observing their perceptions. If you wanted to look at the role of ultrasound in cytology and thyroid cancer diagnosis, again, this could be observational if you um, are not doing more ultrasound scans or doing more cytology and simply looking at what is already being done. So I hope that clarifies what observational studies are. So essentially, they evaluate the relationship between different variables. Now, in most observational studies, there is a variable called or categorized as exposure. And there's another variable that you could call an endpoint. Now, in some studies, where you're looking at a risk factor and, and the occurrence of disease, the risk factor is the exposure and the occurrence of disease is the endpoint. Like, for example, tobacco smoking and lung cancer. In some other kinds of observational studies, you have treatments and you want to uh, evaluate the relationship of the treatment with a specific outcomes just such as survival or recurrence. So here the treatment is the exposure and the clinical outcome, uh, which could be survival or recurrence, is the endpoint. Right. So the three main types of observational studies. Again, very briefly, you've got the case control group of studies where you start off with the endpoint, and then you look back to see where the exposures occurred. So you start off with healthy people and people with the disease, and then you look to see um, you know, what kind of uh, exposure they've had to the risk factor in each of these two groups. The second type of observational studies are the cohort studies, where you don't start at the endpoint, you start with the exposure to either the risk factor or the treatment, and then over time you look to see if the endpoint has occurred. 
or the outcome has occurred. And so, uh, uh, so these are cohort studies. And the third main group of observational studies is what we call cross-sectional studies, where you evaluate both the endpoint and the exposure together uh, at, at, at any point in time. There are some other kinds of observational studies that we won't go into any detail now, and these are ecological studies and proportional mortality studies, but uh, they're not um, really, um, they don't fall within the scope of this talk. Right, so we've learned what observational studies are, or we've had a quick revision, and now we move on to what a bias is. So a bias is something that systematically deviates the results of a study from the truth. The word systematic is key, as opposed to error, which is simply a mistake that is random, that is not systematic. So it could be an act of commission or omission. Now let's uh, just look at uh, an example. So let's say you, we are looking at a trial that's comparing laparoscopic versus open colorectal surgery in an acute setting, akin to the trial that we just discussed. A bias in the conduct of this trial would, could be something like you include surgeons with very little laparoscopic experience and then randomize patients um, who need either open or laparoscopic surgery to those surgeons. So they'll, they'll obviously be adept at doing open surgery, but maybe not so much with laparoscopic surgery, and therefore you're introducing bias. So that's one example. It could be that you have surgeons who are recruiting patients who know what um, is going to come next in the random sequence. So if they have a prejudice um, against a specific treatment, that might bias their recruitment, and you might uh, it might lead to what you call selection bias. It, it could be that there's a high rate of protocol deviation or dropouts. Let's say, for example, you randomize quite a few patients to open surgery, and they then, after randomization, before being wheeled into theater, have expressed a clear wish to have laparoscopic surgery, if this happens very frequently, that's going to significantly bias your results. So that's another example of bias. How about errors in these kinds of studies? Errors are, like I say, very random, simple mistakes, maybe sometimes not so simple. But examples are things like um, you have included a patient who actually did not meet all your eligibility criteria, and that was a mistake. And you uh, or the researcher has um, made some errors in transcribing what's in the operation note into the data collection form. That could be a mistake. Uh, if you've got the incorrect date of discharge, for example, instead of 11 days in hospital, you've got one day in hospital, and if you're comparing length of stay in the two groups, then that's a mistake. So I hope this clearly explains the difference between bias and error. Now, when we say error in this context, this is different to the errors we talk about in clinical research and um, where we categorize uh, results of the study in testing a null hypothesis. And if you have errors there, you call them type one and type two errors. Those errors um, are, uh, are relevant in another context and, and not um, doesn't relate to the type of errors that we've just discussed. Okay, so I'm hoping that makes sense. Now, You've got to keep in mind that bias can occur at any stage in um, a trial. So from the planning stage, conduct, analysis, and reporting, you can have bias in, uh, at any um, point in time. Now, I've got a few examples of bias at, at each stage of a, um, of a study, and these are all on the screen here. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail um, into all of these uh, biases. And these are just examples of numerous types of biases um, that can take place in every part of the study. So just a few examples. So if you look at flawed uh, study design, so if you've got a study design, that's probably a case control study, um, which may not be appropriate um, for a study that, uh, which really wants to estimate risk of a particular outcome from a, from a risk factor, uh, you want to get a good estimate of risk, you really need relative risk, and a case control study is not suited to uh, give you relative risk, then you've got to design for right at the start. Yeah. So if, uh, for example, um, uh, detection bias. So if um, there is a problem with, um, uh, with diagnosing a, a condition on an imaging study, 
uh, and you do not um, ensure that the radiologists who are interpreting the images have a clear understanding of the requirements of the study and you don't validate the radiologist interpretation, then you've got a problem. That's detection bias. Uh, an example for bias during analysis would be a grouping bias. That's a good example. So we previously discussed um, the principles of analysis in randomized controlled trials. We talked about intention retreat analysis and uh, per protocol analysis. And, and in intention retreat analysis, you analyze the patients according to the arm that they were randomized to, regardless of whether they got that treatment. And if you don't do it that way, you'll have a grouping bias. You would have put the patient in the group that you were intending to, and that'll be a problem. And in in reporting, you can have something called publication bias. Uh, you all probably know that um, studies that have negative results or, or results that are not very exciting struggle to get published and they don't come to uh, come into the limelight. Uh, and more and more studies of those kinds may be done. Um, uh, and then uh, if you're doing a meta-analysis, and you're looking for all studies in a particular area and you're basing your retrieval of studies based on what is published, then you might not get the studies that haven't made it into print because they had negative results. So that could bias the results of your meta-analysis. Okay, so, so, so much for bias and the types of bias. And now we're going to discuss a specific um, kind of bias called the stage migration bias. So what does this mean? So here's a, an interesting quote. And um, you probably haven't heard of Will Rogers. Will Rogers was an American comedian uh, from the early 20th century. And one day, I think on stage, he said, uh, when the Okies left Oklahoma for and moved to California, they raised the average intelligence level in both states. A uh, bit of an awkward statement to make and in front of um, um, people uh, who were uh, probably from both Oklahoma and California. Now, if you uh, think about this statement a little bit and see how can this happen? How can movement of people from one state to another raise the average IQ in both states? The only way this can happen is if you move a cohort that is below average in its current location, i.e. Oklahoma, to a location where their IQ is above average uh, in the new location. So you might have to think about this. If you're watching this in video format, you might have to pause the video and have a little think to see um, if this makes sense. And then you're starting to wonder, you know, oh, what is he on about? Well, how does this relate to <laughs> clinical research? And then hopefully the next two slides will explain that. But let's consider the example of gastric cancer. And I don't know if you're aware that for de decades there has been this uh, perception that gastric cancer patients in Japan do much better than their counterparts in the Western world. There have been lots of studies from, uh, from the US and Germany um, that have shown survival rates that are much, much inferior to the reports from Japan. And people for, uh, for ages have wondered about why this is the case. So um, this consistent difference in survival between a series of gastric cancer patients in Japan compared to the Western world. And a number of reasons have been postulated. The surgeons in Japan have been saying that it's the surgery that they do, the extent of dissection, D2, D3 dissection, and that's what improves the survival. People in the West have commented on genetic differences and phenotypic differences. People have commented that the average BMI in Japan and for the average patient is much lower than and people in the West, and therefore um, radical surgery is quite difficult to do. People have also commented on the use of aggressive adjuvant treatment in Japan compared to the US. And the debate has, um, has gone on and is still going on to a certain extent. So what then as, um, researchers did was they categorized the cohorts, the cohorts of gastric cancer patients in Japan by stage, and then they compared their, their prognosis. So you um, categorize patients in Japan into stage one, two, three, and four. I won't go into the details of the stages. Uh, I presume a lot of you will know that stage one and two relate to the extent of um, disease within the wall of the stomach. Stage two, three relates to lymph nodes, lymph nodal involvement, and stage four relates to distant disease. Now, I don't know much about gastric cancer myself, but this is a general rule for most solid cancer. <clears throat> 
So stage four stage, when they looked at the survival between Japanese cancer patients and American patients, they found yeah, that stage four stage, the Japanese patients fared better. And when they looked at the prognosis and survival of patients in the surgical um, uh, cohorts, like patients who underwent surgery, and um, kept the non-surgical patients apart and analyzed them separately, they found again that the survival of surgical patients and the non-surgical patients was better in, in Japan compared to the West. So what's happening? If you closely examine and try and understand the context and the, the practices in Japan and the US, both in terms of getting to the diagnosis and the investigations they have in the management pathways, you'll find a number of significant differences. There are differences in presentation. Gastric cancer is much more common in Japan. They do aggressive screening via endoscopy. They're looking for in situ tumors and pre-invasive tumors. They do a number of investigations generally, even in symptomatic patients, in terms of looking for spread of disease. There's obviously differences in the extent of surgery. Um, and for people who are probably not very familiar with gastric cancer surgery, a bit like me, this refers to the amount of lymph nodal dissection that people in Japan tend to do compared to their Western counterparts. They do a much more radical lymph nodal dissection, amongst others. So lots of differences between the Japanese um, management, diagnostic and management strategies and that in the West. And what then, the, what this leads to is a migration of patients down the stages. What does this mean? Let's look at this in a bit more detail. So you've got these different stages of uh, gastric cancer patients in Japan and in the US, and they obviously are drawn from a general, from the community in Japan and from the community in the US. Now, if you employ a screening strategy looking for gastric cancer in asymptomatic healthy individuals who might be at risk, then what you're doing effectively is bringing some patients from the community into stage one. If you then aggressively image them and you have slightly different classification systems, you might be pulling some otherwise stage one patients who might be stage one in the West to stage two because you're looking for um, the tumor infiltration across the wall a bit more closely, you're doing endoscopic ultrasounds and so on and so forth. And, and this is where it all started, the endoscopic ultrasound and so on in the 70s and 80s in Japan. If you do then more extensive surgery in your so-called stage two patients and you're doing D2 and D3 dissections and looking for um, tiny specks of a tumor in lymph nodes or lymph node micrometastasis, the moment you have a, micro, uh, a metastasis in a lymph node, you're moving patients to stage three. And if you follow the logic, the more investigations you do, the more you're likely to upstage patients from one to four, two to four, three to four, because if you do a uh, whole body CT scans, PET scans, radionuclide scans, and bone biopsies looking for cancer, you will find some patients within stage one, two, and three that you will then recategorize as stage four. So I hope you've been following what I'm saying. So what I'm saying effectively is that there is a migration of the cohorts down the stages, and this migration of cohorts are moving patients from the general population to stage one, stage one to stage two, stage two to stage three, and so on and so forth, improves the prognosis of each of these cohorts compared to the Americans who do not necessarily adopt these aggressive strategies. And therefore, these comparisons are flawed. And, and you shouldn't really be claiming that the treatment in Japan is better because this comparison is subject to what we call stage migration bias. So I hope um, uh, this uh, explanation of stage migration bias um, is uh, adequate because this is quite um, a common phenomenon, affects not just gastric cancer, but lots of other um, uh, cancers and also other diseases. And there's a link to a paper here that explains um, stage migration bias from the context of lung cancer. It was first described in the New England Journal of Medicine a few decades ago. And so it's a good read if you're interested. So keep in mind that stage migration bias can occur in a variety of scenarios. Primarily affects observational research, observational studies. And the potential solutions are essentially an awareness of this phenomenon, awareness of stage migration, and also um, the need for you to understand the population in which these studies are done, 
and the setting, including the screening practices, the diagnostic practices, the investigations usually employed and how they can be different and then the treatment pathways. Okay, so we'll move on to another kind of bias that I think is quite interesting and is useful to keep in mind. This is what we call the immortal time bias or survivorship bias. Right, so in a study that compares different cohorts, the outcome of interest does not occur in a cohort for a specific time period. So this is what you need for survivorship bias to occur. I mean, this statement by itself may not make much sense, but hopefully the, an example will. So if you want to compare, let's say, cardiac bypass versus best medical treatment for a group of patients who say present with um, severe angina over a period of two to three years in a tertiary hospital like Sheffield, and you want to do a retrospective cohort study, then you have a group of patients who've had a bypass for angina, and you have a group of patients that have had best medical treatment. And let's say you find that cardiac bypass patients perform better. Now this could be, this could well be, uh, because cardiac bypass is much more effective than best medical treatment. However, there's another potential reason. And this might uh, appear quite logical um, uh, as I explain. So the surgical group has probably survived the initial period after angina and are probably fitter because unless the patient has survived the angina and then be listed on, put on, uh, on a semi-urgent list and then had a bypass um, and then they've survived the time leading up to the bypass, they're not going to have the bypass. In other words, the surgical group could not have died early in the management pathway. In other words, they had to be immortal that's the reason for the name immortal time bias. They've had to be immortal in the early period to end up uh, having an operation. And the early deaths, the deaths that have probably occurred within the first few days or weeks, would have been classed as having best medical treatment in an observational study. And therefore, um, the best medical treatment will have quite a few patients who really are in the poor prognostic category. And therefore, this is not a fair comparison. And you should be very cautious about saying, oh, surgery is clearly more effective in these kinds of observational studies. OK, so you're probably not very interested if you're a general surgical trainee in the example I've given you. So let's look at an example from colorectal cancer. So this is a um, survival curve, uh, well, a set of survival curves. We've not talked about survival curves before, but, uh, but uh, hopefully we will do soon. Uh, so, so bear with me while I explain this curve. Um, they do say a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is a really interesting picture that gives a lot of information. So this survival curve gives you, there are four curves. These are all Kaplan-Meier curves. And the, you can see that the overall survival of patients with colorectal cancer uh, is indicated by this solid, maybe purple line. Patients who have stage three colorectal cancer and who have not undergone liver resection, obviously stage three patients don't, their survival is shown by this dotted, uh, sorry, dashed uh, blue line, slightly dark. The survival of patients who've had stage four disease and, there, and uh, um, not had liver resection are shown, is shown by this line here, as I'm pointing out. And the survival of patients who um, have stage four disease and liver meds and have had a liver resection is shown by this line here the faint dashed blue line. Now clearly, stage four patients are performing badly, but why are stage four patients who've had a liver resection doing better than stage three and the overall group? That's odd. So it's clearly um, uh, very, very likely that the, stage, uh, that the stage four patients who are undergoing a liver resection are probably the fitter of uh, the lot and they're able to sustain um, you know, liver uh, resection surgery, and there could be bias, the immortal time bias at play here. Now, if you talk to hepatobility pan pancreatic surgeons, liver surgeons, they're all very keen on saying, uh, on, on uh, doing liver resections for colorectal liver metastasis on the presumption that resection of colorectal liver metastasis improves survival. But this is from observational studies. There is no randomized controlled trial evidence, to my knowledge, that colorectal liver resection uh, improves um, the survival of these patients. 
So you've got to take this observational study data with a pinch of salt. You've got to think about whether immortal time bias could be at play here. But the other very interesting observation with this in this um, figure um, to those uh, with a keen eye is you might have observed that the three survival curves here of patients who've not had liver resections has an early dip and carries on and then plateaus. However, the patients who have had liver resection, they are plateauing first and then are dipping later. That itself is evidence that these are um, fitter patients because for most cancer survival um, curves or survival curves for patients with cancer, there's all, often or almost always an early dip indicating that pa some patients have aggressive disease and, and succumb from the disease and then you have a plateau. So this curve for liver resection is quite artificial and therefore you have to assume that immortal time bias is at, is at play here. And again, if you're really interested, there's a very interesting article in an epidemiology journal explaining this concept in a lot of uh, detail. Right. So what have we learned today? We've, we've talked about bias, the types of bias, and the fact that bias can occur anywhere along the, uh, along, uh, the path of a clinical study. And just keep in mind that bias is systematic while error is random. And like I say, bias can occur at any stage of a study. We've been talking about stage migration phenomenon, or some people call it the Will Rogers phenomenon, after the comedian that first talked about it. And this is important in epidemiological studies, primarily on cancer. And then we've talked about immortal time bias or survivorship bias. And just think of uh, the role of treatment pathways and how patients get onto specific treatments and um, when you're comparing different treatments, especially surgery versus non-surgical non -surgical treatment. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.